Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. But the fun doesn't stop there, no sorry. Every few episodes, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will ask you, the listener, to vote on which movie they will play as an RPG, recorded in video and in glorious black and white, and brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! I don't know, but that music always really gets me in the mood to talk about some movies and games. What about you guys? I gotta say, I'm... That was just a shot out of the dark when I first suggested it, because I've always loved people speaking like that. With a transatlantic voice. Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's just, here, boy. No, 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 that, that's mobster. It's different. It, yeah, it's, definitely. It's, mm-hmm. it's British mixed with American. It's cultured. It's educated. And, I mean, I've just, I've always loved it. I've loved it every time I've heard it in Futurama. I think Isaac knocked it out of the park. He gave us multiple takes. He gave me... Way more content than I thought that <laughs> he gave uh, we you would like ever get. Twenty takes. We have he? a whole lot of takes. We have some alternate takes as well, which you might get to hear at some which point. Are kind of funny on some of them. If I include in like maybe a special episode or one of our theme weeks that we have planned that we aren't talking about just yet. One of those days, we should really do it. Just like all all the weird stuff that we get cut. That's too profane too rude because <laughs> we're just never nasty. profane never. well we we did just launch this week mm-hmm. we, um, we, that was amazing if you're so much fun i haven't hit refresh so much since i launched giant robot army <laughs> films i just kept hovering over the the facebook group and trying not to hover over you going what do we got now what do we got now what do we yeah. got now what do we got now pretty much yeah yeah I, i've right. spent the last it was exciting two days just staring at it yeah um it's exciting it is it, it, i mean it really is i was incredibly excited the whole time yeah, so the whole just, day yeah i think i kind of sloughed off on my work day like kind of giddy <laughs> i was there, i, I there have was no real I, I have no delta for it i really the, don't the, i had a real fear that we would just be talking into a void mm-hmm. yeah. yeah i think we all did if you've been listening to us you know that we are a few weeks ahead mm-hmm. we recorded uh the first four episodes and this is the fourth of our first batch again as kind of a proof of concept I think the concept has been the well proved. Yeah, the proved. concept has been well I think received we it. so far. I think it's good. And I've already gotten feedback from a couple of people who very much want to get in at the ground level and support us in some way. Mm-hmm. We're considering putting out a Patreon of some kind. It's in the process. I'm not really going to lead it out there. We'll see if there's enough interest. And if there is, that'd be great. It would kind of help us with some of our uh, hosting costs. It has been a little equipment. spendy. It has been. I think a little bit. And I think anybody <laughs> listening can tell that hopefully the sound has improved a bit as we've consolidated the equipment. We've unified the microphones mm-hmm. here. Now we have our colorful little pop filters. Yes, and... I'm I'm always on a blue filter. Orange. It looks like the sun. Mine's red, but I'm I'm I might have a little bit of color blindness and then it's hard for me to tell the red. It is it's red. You you have yeah. a red rocket in front of your mouth. Thank you, Isaac, for everything that you've done. <laughs> yes, awesome. thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Sorry Isaac. About we do appreciate it. You, you were amazing on that. The, oh, hey, we haven't even like officially started yet. So, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And this is the Have Movies Will Game podcast. And this week, we are doing a movie I had never, ever watched. And it's weird because I like everyone in it. And it's part of the realm of movies that I should have grown up watching. But I never did. Yeah, we did Sneakers this week. And one it was, of my favorite films of all time. I'm really glad you suggested it. I had no idea. It had a lot of actors that I really enjoy in it. It had Ben Kingsley. Oh, yeah. We're going to get oh. to the cast. Yeah. It, it, oh. sit, I'll hold off my excitement for the moment. <laughs> I just, I just want to say his name again. Ben Kingsley. You're forgetting a part. Sir Ben Kingsley. Yes. There you That's go. true. Uh, apparently, he's very adamant about when you, when you address him. It Sir, is ben, Sir Kingsley. ben Kingsley. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm actually... He is shamefully I, I, I bowing bow. his head right there. <laughs> as, as a commoner to a uh, a landed knight, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about movies like this, and it's it's a rare breed of movie that follows into this concept of competence porn, where the characters right. are all really good at what they do. Yeah, you so don't you're watch like, it really good. Yes, you don't watch a movie like this to see if they're going to succeed. You watch a movie like this to see how they're going to succeed. Yeah. yeah. Very much like Ocean's Eleven. 
Leverage. Yeah, yeah the Leverage. Show leverage well. the TV show. Yeah. That I haven't seen. Which but... was recorded here in Portland. Yeah. They tried to make it look like Boston. They said it was in Boston. And was... eventually they finally said it was Portland. Mm-hmm. And I think they were in one of the breweries. Yeah, they, they actually, Bridgeport. the show moved in the show moved to portland so that's very nice yeah. are you reaching is it is it that time so is from it old my notes, time? Yeah. from our from our show notes we have a, no, a bullet no, point item which is no, to profess our love of no, old granddad no i'm yes, doing that right no. now i oh, do not please love see it. the uh the link in the link dump below <laughs> That might or might not. I'll, I'll, I'm content we'll with my blackberry cider. I've day. actually got this idea. So Matthew Speaking was like, of which, I would like Matthew to- was like, hey, I want you to start linking to old granddad and all of our show notes. And I thought of a really fun way to do this. I'm going to start hiding links to old granddad in our show notes. Oh, really? But they're not going to be obvious. You have to find them. It's going to be like one of those adventure games where you have to click around until you find until the mouse changes. You're going to have to move your mouse over our show notes until it changes. And that just might take you to the website of what is not currently, but (laughs) hopefully one day will be our sponsor. You've made me the happiest alcoholic ever. Oddly enough, when there was that post about having the old granddad, like, hey, let's say this at every episode, and neither Nathaniel or myself said anything, I was like, yes, that's a dead thing. It's not even going to come Oh, no. No, no, no. no. That, you that's you a, that's can a, that's fight a me over it, but it is happening. <laughs> that's a resounding no. It's not going to happen, and it's happening. I put it in there as a joke just to make Matthew laugh. It isn't a joke. clung to it with it's very serious life. Old granddad is serious business. So, yeah, sneakers. Yes, sneakers. So, we are here to talk about sneakers tonight. <laughs> Not booze? We should I'm do that podcast. Kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are talking about sneakers tonight. Uh, it is uh, one of my favorite movies. Uh, but you actually, Nathaniel, you brought this one to the table. I'm so, glad you did. Yes, did you like that? Did you like I that? thought it was amazing. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, I liked everything about it except one thing that I'll get into later. Okay. This is what, 20. Five years later, easily yep. it was put. It, it was released in 1992. Yep, 25 years yep. later, your first time seeing it. Yeah, and you liked it. Yeah, that's fantastic. What was it that you really liked to make it to bring it to the table? Sneakers is what I consider again. I've already said this competence porn, and mm-hmm. I really dig that. When I first started getting into role playing games, was because of Indiana Jones, and Indiana Jones to me is a competent person. Mm-hmm. He is someone who is good at what he does. I started role playing because I wanted to be Indiana Jones, but that also influenced my love of movies and other stories, books, television shows. I love seeing good people do awesome things and win. Yeah. I like seeing some adversity in it, but I've never really been a fan of the whole low man up from the bottom, Mm -hmm. the the pig farmer who rises to take over the kingdom. That's just stories they tell to make small people feel better. And it's very cliched. I like stories of the Robin Hood troop of characters. I like the people who are really good at what they do and also not awful people. Mm -hmm. So Sneakers is high tech, but lo-fi and Mm -hmm. quite nonviolent. Very, It is a very cerebral story. And that's what I love about it. Also, when I first saw it, I was kind of considering myself wanting to be one of those K-Rad elite Hacksaw people. <laughs> Aww. This is like 1994, I think, when I first saw it. Mm-hmm. I was 14. I had just gotten my second computer with a modem. When did Hackers come out? 92. No, uh, 95. So, so there was actually a lot of this going no, on. We had this conversation. The yeah. Hackers? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought yeah. we were talking about sneakers. sneakers. 92. Yeah. Yeah, that was like a trope going around just in general at the time as everyone was starting to buy a computer, mm-hmm. you know, a personal computer. With hackers. Oh, my God. It's got a 288 modem. Wow. Yeah. 486 DX, son. We should put oh. hackers on the list and t- say all this stuff because I have pages pages oh, I love that movie. pages of but dialogue they, but about back to sneakers movie. yeah back, 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 to sneakers. back to sneakers and confidence so, yeah. porn characters being awesome mm-hmm. like and not just messing up and happening to win but failing like, up a well yeah. executed plan you have already mentioned oceans 11 mm-hmm. oceans 11 is another kind of story that is one of my favorites it's just people being awesome i am a big big fan of what i call the snatch and grab movies which are hi- which are heist movies? I, yeah. A lot of people are like, "Oh my god, is that like porn?" No, 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 no. It's for me. It's a, that's a heist movie, a good heist movie. 
you you snatch whatever you need to grab from the bank vault and you know you grab it and yeah. you go so that's my i like those movies i loved watching the technology so much oh it reminded the cradle modem i'm gonna the I'll real get into to that. real oh, i'll get God. into that there's there's one thing be- before before we kind of get into into anything major did you happen to notice there's one scene later in the movie where they're uh at liz's apartment where they, they've hooked everything up. They're like, we're going to take over your apartment. Yeah, yeah. Did you happen to notice there was an Atari 5200 that yes, they had I did. set, set yeah. up? Yeah, okay. Not a lot of people really noticed that. So cross speaking that off. of all of this technology, mm-hmm. I do have a question. Okay. Mm-hmm. The movie begins in what? Nin- what, 69? Is yeah. that when it- Nixon. Yeah, the Nixon era. Did cybercrime exist in 1969? More or less, because if you like, want to get into the historical side of things... I forget his name, and I could Google him right now, but there was a gentleman that Captain Crunch used to come with a whistle as a toy, and this gentleman found- It was found, the one for the phone, Yeah, right? this gentleman yeah. found that it was the same exact tone that would that would crack the, the, the dial tone for free long distance. That term is called freaking, with a PH, like fat dog <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there, there were there were cyber crimes because they you, you could you could hack into places like banks yeah. if you had the right software a, mo- a cradle modem you could it was very easy because that technology came about early 60s when when computers were starting to talk to each other so it was there you just you had a very select few that knew how yeah. i'm always really hazy on my internet history pre 1980s. Yeah, because we're so you we're that generation of 91 92 when you know America online is now up and going or 93 somewhere in that I was that online area. before America online. Yeah, my, yeah. So, my, well, yeah, I mean I was BBS's too. BBS is yeah. BBS so was definitely. I. Yeah. My first favorite game off of a BBS was called Morass Revenge, which is this like dungeon crawl which was amazing as a kid. I saved my doom saves on a backup tape oh. deck recorder. Oh. Wow. wow. Yeah. Do you remember Doom that? Wads. I, I remember dialing into mm-hmm. local bulletin boards to download Doom Wads yeah. mm-hmm. to play people's custom levels. Oh, yeah. But my favorite BBS game was Trade Wars. Okay. Trade Wars 2000. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. I remember that. that one, and that I haven't one, thought or, of it in 20 years. <laughs> there's an online Trade Wars number of online <laughs> Trade Wars servers that you can go and log on to right now on, on the web. All right, so Sneakers, uh, arguably one of our favorite movies, as we've already decided, first for the, the non-ever-seeing Sneakers person, uh, and then That's me. Nathaniel and, and myself loving this movie. I remember seeing it in the theater with my dad, uh, which is a fond memory of mine. Uh, it was 92 when it was released, so that would have put me in my freshman, sophomore year in high school. I right. think I saw it rented from the local video store, the mm-hmm. family-owned mom-and-pop yeah family video for those of you under 30 a video store is a place (laughs) like a convenience store where you go and on the shelves they have movies it's a store of red box basically yeah but you have to rewind those movies when you take them back yeah because dvds weren't you're not kind you can still find them in small towns here on the Oregon coast. The coast yeah, there, is a, there is a blockbuster out in like Sandy, I think, yeah. that's still we actively did, running. I'm pretty sure we had a conversation where we're looking up blockbusters and there's like a thousand or more of them. That, I think, existence. was in our test yeah. episode. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah it the, was our the test. lost episode. Yeah. You know, one thing I have to say, and this just struck me as my, my first time watching it. I'd never seen mm. this movie. You is, are welcome, is, sir. Is, thanks. Is how perfectly this... This movie was made for what you and I and you are doing here. Mm -hmm. It has a party. And on a lot of these other episodes, we've been like, well, there's the hero, there's the partner. Mm -hmm. Those are all you could play. And the rest are NPCs. Yeah, I think this This is our first party movie. This had a party of playable characters. And and we will get to, we're going to get in depth on some of those characters. This is the first time that happened. I know. I thought that was, yeah, I was like, I don't think uh, we intentionally chose. Movies no, with you no were, parties you, before. I think we were mainly just like, we all love this the movie. Fifth element. Good. We're yeah. going to start with the yeah. fifth element, and yeah. then everything else sort of fell organically from there. You're the one that, that brought this to the table, and it was I, a good I choice. I just really liked this movie. It was a really <laughs> good movie. Cho- I wanted a, like a cybercrime movie, and I thought, what better way to start with cybercrime than with sneakers? I'm sure we would have gotten to it down the list, but I'm really glad that it, it was early on. So, Matthew, your first time seeing this movie. What were your main takeaways from this? Like, what was about it that you just loved it the most? Uh, I was like, this is good. This is good. I'm really impressed with this. This is good. And then at the end of the movie, which Mm -hmm. honestly, there was a scene that it it probably could have come earlier and it would have have grabbed me earlier. He's on the ladder. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's such a great scene with and Cosmo. He goes, and he just goes, don't go. Oh, my God. I paused. I got a little teary eyed. <laughs> I was like, God, that's why you're Sir Ben Kingsley. I mean, th- there was a lot of things that grabbed me about it. I had no connection with Ben Kingsley's character. Really? I didn't yeah. right up until None. that oh. point. I well, knew exactly you, who it was the moment they revealed his face. It's like, oh, that, that's you don't, the kid. Yeah. It, it's one of those few movies where the reveal of the bad guy is at the end, and he's it works. He's not a bad guy. Well, in quotes, bad guy. He's, yeah. he's the antagonist for the movie. You see, I that was one of the things I liked about this was there wasn't just a clear cut villain that ha ha blood guts gore yeah he had I'm henchmen evil, that he, physically he, abused the main character mm-hmm. he's a bad guy yeah no. he and he didn't bat an eye at it well, no he in he's, fact he's pulled a, his henchmen to kill him he's no. a bad guy that is doing trying to do good I know I I disagree completely please shoot my friend right here shoot my shoot my friend tell me how was that doing good okay up until that point yeah. to break an omelet I right, to make an omelet you have to break some eggs. <laughs> You, you, there, there's no revolution that ever went off bloodless lawful evil definitely no no i i have to say that uh, i didn't see him as as the villain certainly the antagonist cer- I, I i'll buy that but not a villain he was trying to do good throughout the whole thing <laughs> no he wanted power yeah he no. wanted power he wanted equality it was no it was pretty clear that he wanted power. no he, he wanted wa- equality that's what he said he wanted the power and he, he wanted went, the power i mean I, I, he is the antagonist but he still wanted the he wanted the power. Look, look at that box. Come on. I mean, the power to reset everything to destroy all the financial records. How would he profit from that? Because he would destroy he would everything hold, but his own. He would and, hold every the entire yeah. world at ransom. Essentially, yeah. Well, I've there's there's the line. Good. There's a war out there, a world war, and it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. Right. He controls the information. Yeah. There's no way he would but restart he, himself. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I, have, I this this is, I, this is, I, I, is I, I be stubborn about this. This one. is that no, no, point no. of dissent that people are wanting. <laughs> no, I'll I'll, t- I'll tell you this much: he wouldn't have had that emotional reaction if he wasn't thwarted in his collegehood dreams of restarting everyone to zero. That that don't that, go. That is what he is. That don't go. That you may comment. I mean that that was a very visceral part of his character. You know the vulnerability coming out, and it was great. It was wonderful. But I think that, yes, he's still the antagonist, and he still wants his best friend next to him. Who, I'll say antagonist. We, I we just started won't say this villain. journey together, Marty. He was still hoping for that, and he couldn't get it. So. I have more empathy with him than anyone else in the movie. I don't know what that makes me, but... <laughs> <laughs> Lawful evil, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> actually, I think if we were, uh, if we want to be true to ourselves, we should do all of our alignment litmus tests on palladium alignments. And I would say aberrant. I stayed away from. Oh, that's fair. I'll palladium. show you all the palladium you want to see. <laughs> no, <laughs> really. I no, no, no. I will make time for you. <laughs> Is this one of those? The, those I will show you, and and I'm gonna get like trapped I will show in the. You the world. <laughs> I, I, I could agree that, that he was the antagonist, but I, I, you will never convince me that he is a villain. If he really, really, really wanted the main character to join him, he would have done the rational thing, showed up at his office one day, out of the blue, and be like, hey, remember me? I went to jail. Shit he happened. thought he was betrayed by him. Then why would he have tried to convince him to join him? His motives were so wishy-washy the whole time. Oh, hey, I'm going to change everything. Join me. Okay, die. I mean, it was and, and everything. He, and he got Russian operatives to Russian help. operatives. Ex, in, NSA. NSA rogue Russian operatives. Yeah. Not to get political, <laughs> but isn't that the, the standard? We're talking about the political climate of 1992. Right. When they were no longer the evil empire and Glasnost happened. I think the Cold they were War our was allies then. kind of it, fresh. Yeah, it yeah. just ended because actually the Russians were considered the enemies. No, no, no. I, re- I remember the narrative no, of the early nineties through the movie. They kept thinking that it was Russians. Yeah, Russians, Russians, Russians. Yeah. They even they had were... the Russian attaché yep. who made comment. It's been a very confusing time for my people. Yeah, that's because we were apparently coming together, and it's all friends, and the Cold War is <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, his his motives were unclear and wishy washy to the point that I was I was definitely leaning towards him being villain okay nope. those henchmen you don't work with shitty henchmen well, yeah no, those guys were shady like, henchmen th- th- like th- those henchmen were very much i'm just gonna straight up kill yeah. you i am not willing to condemn a man who's going off the greater good just because he has a past 
I know there's not going to be any way to change your mind. Of, oh, certainly of his, there is. I just need overwhelming logic, level, and I'm not seeing uh, it yet. It's, well, he's I'm, a bad not, guy. We're not condemning him because of his no, past. We're no, condemning him because of his present actions. Why? Nobody died. Were, oh, except for the cultural attache. They, and they killed the scientist. Yeah. Yeah, but he was a dick. Did you hear how snooty he was? No. He was really into his work. Yeah. And he wore terrible 90s jackets, but he was into his work. <laughs> Did you see his hair? That man deserved to die. And he had a intelligent... Well, she was a scientist too, mm-hmm. right? She was totally in love with yeah. him. They they seem like interesting characters. That, that, that was <laughs> that really. was Dunno, that was that was Dono Logue who played in Blade, and he plays in uh, Gotham right now. Oh, yes, yeah, he does. Yeah, he? he he was in Blade. Is that I'm going to be a vampire god, a naughty, naughty vampire god. <laughs> I, I I'm just going to say what when you when you look at what morality is, mm-hmm. okay, when when you think about how to do the most good for the greatest amount of people. Mm-hmm. But he was ultimately doing it just for himself. You don't know that. I he was they doing. He job. was doing it I, out I, of college, out of his college idealism. He never said that he was holding the world for idealism, ran- holding the world for ransom. Had, had that pretty much didn't happen. He was an extremely rich man. Yeah, he was an extremely rich that man that ran a, a company that worked for the mob, mm-hmm. fixing their books, and he was going to wipe everything out, and he was going to be on the top of the hill. Control of resources would place you near the top of the hill in a post-apocalyptic. M- Nobody has any money, kind of world. Yeah, control of resources would place you at the top of the I hill. Think I and need with that drink. box, that's what he'd be doing. If you crash the system, it doesn't come back. That box is a one-time. No, it doesn't crash systems. It just accesses. Yeah, it just, just accesses. It's a code breaker. That's not a, all. It was. Not a system crash. No, 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 no. It no. didn't crash. Once the that happens, though, and you crash the system, well, you don't get to do that I again. Look I don't. At how fast I they don't trace the nine-point bounce that he was going to crash the system. I think he was ultimately going to hold the world. You leave Ben Kingsley alone. Yeah, yeah I don't know if if this is if just me, but I, I honestly I have, I have too much sympathy with that character. I just do. No, that's fine. That's this is a dissenting point, and that's awesome because we up till now we haven't really had that, and yeah. that's awesome. And I, I will say this: uh, the, the the titular hero mm-hmm. lied to his ex girlfriend. No, he. No. Who are you now? No, 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 because he said early on, they found me, Liz. She knew a long time ago what he was going through. Yeah. She was the only person she I was, think yeah, knew. Yeah, the only person I think Sidney Poitier knew because he, he knows everything. No, didn't tell no, no, his no, friends. His, his party, he didn't know. Wait, wait, he didn't, didn't know. Sidney Poitier didn't know? His party no. did not know <laughs> until they came to him and said, he hey, knew. we know who you are, the, the NSA yeah. Russian agents. I'm yeah. just saying if I have to choose between Robert Redford and... You're going to go with the blue eyes, aren't you? Robert Redford. No, if I have I to know, choose between Robert I, I Redford and a knight of I don't know what Mary they make McDonald. actors. Mary McDonald. What do they Mary make McDonald. actors? Is it Knight of the Rose? No, it, that's Dragon Lance. No, 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 no. <laughs> no th- there is, there is, there is an actual uh, knight of the rose, of, of different knights. Knight of the Rose, Knight of the Sword, Knight of the Crown. That's. Are you talking about it's knights also Templar? English knights. There, there are ranks of knights. There are artists. Oh, that I don't are, know those. Anyway. <laughs> We're getting all Dragonlance up in here with some sneakers, y'all. <laughs> I miss Dragonlances, and you know you miss Kender. Uh, oh, not we again. Had, we had a couple of Kender in this movie. Let's keep diving into things and see how that all rolls out. You yes, are sir. drinking a delightful beverage. Yes, I am. I am actually drinking uh, the Blackberry Cider from the McMinimins Barley Mill. That's where you Hawthorne. do all of your writing, right? That's where I write my book. Yeah, I'm a regular there. They know me. I know pretty much the entire staff by first name now. Oh, nice. How much uh, How much is that? That's a big-ass bottle. That That's is like a 64-ounce growler. <laughs> yes, so there, there is 64 ounces of delicious Oregon Blackberry Cider that they make on our table tonight that That's I am very nice. happily drinking instead of what you like. Now, I have to say this. I don't often drink things that aren't golden and say bourbon mm-hmm. on it. Um, I had a sip of it. And as a as a non-cider beer wine, mm-hmm. just a, a savage who drinks from the bottle, mm-hmm. that was actually really good. Ben Kingsley was the hero. I just want to say that. No, he wasn't. I'm sorry. Because the hero was... The, the hero was Robert Redford, Mar- who played Martin Bishop, who was also an Oscar winner. For this movie? No, not for this movie. Uh. He was an Oscar <laughs> winner in the past. So Robert Redford plays our hero, Marty Bishop. Martin Your Bishop. hero. Wait, Marty, so, so far, that's two Oscar winners. Marty Bryce. Right? And then we have Sidney Poitier. Is that uh, three? 
Yeah, hang on, I'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who plays Donald Kreese? What's the running tally of Oscar winner, guys? He was, I gotta know. He, I'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, he was also an Oscar winner. He known for Raisin in the Sun, The Jackal, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and a whole bunch of other movies that I'm pretty sure that a lot of our listeners have not seen. I think everybody knows who Sidney Poitier is. Just by... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, the vo- he's almost as noticeable, <laughs> notable as James Earl Jones, who was also in this movie. I picked him up right at that phone call, too. I'm like, is that... Is that- James Earl Jones. Sidney Poitier ate every scene that he was in. Oh, it was like, great. His voice, his face, those eyes. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, I think was made, made a joke about blackface, mm-hmm. and Sidney's like, yeah, like he, that he look his... of the hell you talking no, about. No, what did he say? He said midnight. Yeah, midnight or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and just it was like from angry to just this cold, the cold face yeah, of it a was, man who was going to. Fucking they were they were in you. the truck towards the <laughs> yeah. end, and one of the hench, just the no name NPC henchmen, said, "And you, midnight, don't move." And yeah, then it was that look. And, and his yeah. follow up line: "Motherfuckers mess with me, I split their head." <laughs> yep, Forty Eight owned every scene that he was in. He stole a lot of the scenes, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, uh, ben, Sir Sir Ben Kingsley, who plays Cosmo, the hero, uh, who is also an Oscar winner, known for Gandhi, Schindler's List. One of my other favorites, Lucky Number Slevin, which yeah, yeah. I love that movie, and uh, Iron Man 3. Then we get into, I, I broke this down on the cast members of like who had an Oscar, who was nominated for an Oscar, and then who didn't, his right. member had an Oscar. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. I've never been able to pronounce it correctly. David Strathairn, who played Whistler. Strathen? Strath- who played Whistler, the, the blind guy. That he, was a great character. Yes. He was an Oscar nominee, uh, also known for Eight Men Out. Uh, he was in Memphis Belle, if you've seen that. I have. Yeah. Uh, Good Night and Good Luck, which is an amazingly done movie. And then two of the Bourne movies, where he played the uh, antagonist. Uh, the uh, Oh, of, that was him. Yeah, he was uh, the leader of, okay. of Treadstone, basically. Oh, he was setting it I up. I didn't even recognize him. Yeah, also, was, was apparently him. the man responsible for kids putting their hat up like that. Did you notice that his hat was like that through the whole movie? Like what? Oh, the bill you, was you, you up. have a baseball hat, and then they carefully get the end up. That that that's a new trend. That it's bending. not apparently. It came out in ninety two. No, I don't. I don't think it was a trend then. I think it was something that he just did. He was so good. He you're talking himself. about Whistler? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I didn't even notice his hat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even and, pay attention to it. And then we have Dan Aykroyd who plays Mother. Yeah. Dan motherfucking uh, Aykroyd. Yeah, <laughs> who is an, another an Oscar nominee. Uh, for blue, not for, but in Blues Brothers, Doctor Detroit, which is one of my favorite yeah. early eighty movies, Ghostbusters, obviously. In this movie, Mother Dan Aykroyd plays the conspiracy theorist, mm-hmm. which apparently is not that far of a leap oh, it's for not. Dan Aykroyd. No. Really? Yeah, he is like full on chemtrails, and Nazis have a, a a moon base and flat Earth, all that whole, all those major conspiracies, but not quite Randy Quaid level. No, he's I think a couple of rungs ben- okay. beneath. <laughs> he's not actually wearing the the tin foil hat, and apparently it wasn't that big of a, a stretch for him. Uh, River Phoenix plays Carl Arbogast, who's also another Oscar nominee, was in Explorers. Stand by me. Stand by me, which is uh, one that we will ultimately some point do. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That's, Stand by me is a great party movie. Too. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's a very good coming yeah. of age party movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the this was the third movie before his death. Uh, he did three movies in one year, yeah. and this is the third one, and and then another, and then he, and then another, and then he passed away in ninety three at the age of twenty three. There's uh, a gaming thing that's. Optional has been put forth by third-party publishers in the D20 and D20 Modern system, um, and that's called a quirk. And it's where you get to add points to something mm-hmm. by taking an obvious flaw. Games yeah. have been doing that for a long yeah. time before D20 Modern, okay. trust me. Yeah. Uh, I, I will trust you on that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just <laughs> I like do. to say that, that that struck me, especially when I was looking at Mother mm-hmm. and... Um, Whistler? Whistler, okay. yeah. They, they took an obvious hit in some way, like Mother... Batshit crazy tinfoil hat. Yeah, it's called. It's taking a flaw. Yeah, yeah. I know. And I have at least seen that uh, recently. Just last night, I was reading a game in preparation for another movie in our next series, which bah, 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 we might not talk you about. You don't do right that now. well enough. Bah, 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 that is better. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> which bah, 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 we won't talk about right now. <laughs> but I was looking at this game, and it was from 1982, mm-hmm. and it already had quirks and flaws yeah. in, in it. So I, did it I, allow you to change stats? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I think a, that's a great game mechanic. Yeah. From 97 until like 2004 or 5, I was big into playing White Wolf's Vampire the Masquerade. They had it. Definitely. I was a LARPer. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, Merits, I and the, yeah. Were, Merits and Flaws. Merits and Flaws. And I, I the prefer big, the Werewolf. I we used to like, wipe the floor I, with you people. I know you could, but I did not <laughs> like the werewolf system. It was so prevalent and so beat into gamers through the white wolf storyteller system mm-hmm. that even today people will come to a new game. And if they have experience with the storyteller system, they will call them merits and flaws. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even if the game calls it something else like edges and traits or hindrances and boons. Everybody still calls it merits and flaws because it's so sort of ingrained into that gaming mentality. And I think I think White Wolf is just put it in all of their games. It's all like everything is merit and flaw in White Wolf. And White Wolf has a lot of games that are that are out there. We should do that one day. So, we should take this outside the studio for one of our things. We could do uh, it for a werewolf game actually, like Underworld. You know, I actually I have a very, very good friend here in Portland that is running a vampire requiem game. Yeah, but are they doing sitting down or running around a park? Oh, should, they're they're running around the, a backyard. Oh, we should totally just kind that. of like a park in Portland, more or less. So, mother's flaw was definitely nut job. Could, yeah, yeah, nut job. He was he was nut job. We'll get back to the if, if we're going to run down merits and flaws. Let me finish a couple of the. Oh, um, sure. Okay. So we also have Mary McDonald who plays Liz. Uh, she was also Oscar nominated. Let's roll with this. Give her a quick merit and flaw. Trusting. Trusting? Yeah. That's her flaw? That's her flaw. Okay. Yeah. Trusting would be her flaw because she was very... Tri- Even though she'd been burned by Martin in the yeah. past because it was very heavily touched on that they had a yeah. relationship, yeah. she had been burned too many times by him. So, And she also didn't like, as she said, the boys club because she couldn't be a right. part of it. She was also, for anybody that doesn't know who that is, she was in Dances with Wolves, that stands with a fist, uh, Independence Day as the president. Uh, oh, shit. Right. Yep. She was in Donnie Darko. But something else you might know her from, which recently. is the president Rosalind in Battlestar Galactica. Oh my God! Your, your head just exploded. <laughs> it really did. I'm like, I know I've seen her. She's just yeah. one of those '80s actors that I thought had gone away, but no, she's, she's been in everything I love. She's actually been <laughs> steadily working since the '80s. Awesome. She is an amazing actress. Actually, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite roles with her was actually in Dances with Wolves. I think that was the first movie i saw of her when i, I never saw kid. that movie can't really everyone in okay concert. so basically go watch avatar and it's the same movie only with an internet chat room and computer <laughs> graphics great white savior <laughs> yeah there's oh, that yeah. i'm so tired of that yeah, I, I i know yeah. and then in my opinion she's ultimately the the cornerstone of this whole movie because this movie would not have been able to go anywhere if she, if her character wasn't there is she what you would call the 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 ace or the no the straight the straight man, yes. I guess. Yeah, she was the straight character. Using the classic term. Yes. Uh, the entire movie, the, the whole movie is a boys club, and and they make a huge reference. It is a boys right. club through the whole movie, but without her charm, without her wit, intelligence, and her feminine wiles, uh, which happened later in the movie with the next actor that I'm going to get to, <laughs> the gang would have never have been able to I succeed. know I've seen him somewhere. You're going to get to him. What, what, what was he? Uh, he's been in a lot. Of I know, I know. Which guy are you, ta- are you talking about? The, the one that she charmed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen. Uh, and I might butcher his last name. Uh, Toblowski, uh, who played Doctor Werner Brandis. He was really good. Yeah, he was for his bit part. His he, that's yeah. most of his career has been bit parts. Yeah, showing he's up. been in everything. I, I've looked at his movie because I'm like, oh, I know a few movies off the top of my head. Yeah. But looking at his like list of movies, he's been like easily 150 movies. Like he's been working a long time. Memento, he was in that. Okay. But you'll probably know him best in Groundhog Day. Oh, no shit? Yeah, he's the one that Phil, and then he gets punched by Bill Murray. Oh, right. Note to self, add Memento to list. Yeah, I think we should add. Should that's a, a great too. one. I think yes. it would be difficult to game, maybe, but it, it might be easy to do. I don't know. Do oh, it. God, I already know a game for it. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, the deep dive on, on that movie alone is going to hurt my brain, but I'm fine with that. Uh, and then we have Darth Vader himself, James Earl Jones, playing NSA agent, Agent Bernard Abbott, or he Abby. Abby so he young. Was. Well, yeah. No, not really. No, James Earl Jones now looks like 25 years later. 
Yeah, I mean, everybody also, looks a little older. He looks 25 old years later. now, and he sounds old. He yeah. still sounds the same. Though. No, he yeah. sounds. Ter- he does he not. Sounds, no. He sounds very close. You guys apparently don't watch Star Wars Rebels because he reprises. I his do role. watch Star Wars Rebels, and I watched Rogue One, and I thought James Earl Jones sounded like a cranky old man. <laughs> Yeah, like, his, his voice love, has changed. I love well, the older Darth changed. Vader voice. Mm-hmm. James Earl Jones needs to pass that job on to his understudy because there is no understudy. There needs to be an no, understudy there, for sure that voice is. because sure when he is. passes, that voice needs to preserved for all it's of the pr- universe to continue loving. It's probably been digitally recorded so many times that they'll just type in what they want. And can I have that app? <laughs> <laughs> I want to do everything in that voice. <laughs> Uh, and he obviously he played Thulsa Doom in Conan the Barbarian. My personal favorite. I love him as Thulsa Doom. Uh, Field of Dreams and The Hunt for Red October. He had a part in that. <laughs> Did you ever see that YouTube vid of somebody took scenes from the what you're first Star about. Wars movie, mm-hmm. but replaced all of James Earl Jones' dialogue from with his dialogue movies? from older movies? Oh, yeah, no. it's great. He sounds like this cantankerous old man mm-hmm. who's just out to make everybody miserable. I think that we should put that link in for this episode someplace. Yeah, yeah. The because best part, it's, it's like it's nine YouTube. minutes. We're allowed to share it. It's nine minutes, but it's basically every scene that Vader was in in, in Star Wars they just cut all yeah, those yeah. scenes and made it. But it, yeah, it's movies from his very early movies up to you know Field of Dreams. Um, it's 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 amazing. It's great. I got to tell you something I loved about this movie was that everyone, including the Fall Guy who she charms to get his mm-hmm. card and his voice print, everyone was was smart. Yes, there was not a stupid Fall Guy in the whole movie. It was which goes back to your com- uh, yeah. well, it goes back to your competence mm-hmm. porn. And that was one of the first things that struck me about this movie. There was no dope. Everyone was intelligent. It was a thoughtful, intelligent thriller. It wasn't a fast-paced, run around and being chased by people with guns thriller. Yeah. All the mm-hmm. guns were in limited scenes. They were used as plot tools. Yeah. There was no violence. Oh, uh, Nick, mm, Towards the end. I wanted to almost said Nick Nolte. Robert Redford <laughs> got hit a couple times. But Has Robert was... Redford always looked old? No. Oh, no. He's... Mm. No, like uh, Paul Newman, he had very young. He had this very, yeah. very attractive... Is that where that came from? Because that's 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 too old for me to have seen those. I mean, I've only seen him like starting in this in this category of movie coming out around so this you period. Never, so you never saw The the Sting? No. Or you never saw Butch, Butch Cassidy, Cassidy and, and the Sundance, Sundance Kid? Nope, which is on our list. There, are, oh, We need to educate you. Educate me. <laughs> you know that Sundance. It's all right. Festival? You 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 can do that, and I will I will bring you into the alignments of Palladium. We we can help each other. <laughs> you you do know that Sundance Film Festival is named after the Butch Cassidy, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance, and the Sundance kid. kid because Robert really? yeah. Redford started the Sundance. I can Film honestly Festival. say I had no idea. Runs the Sundance Film yeah. Festival and named it after his character in that movie. You've never seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I have not. Oh my god. Can we stop recording? We gotta watch this right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, he cannot. But he has some 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 of the great lines in the movie. I love the scene where he's talking to Jenik's girlfriend, and they've got you know we Whistler's in his ear telling him what to say. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whistler even messes with him. Oh, I oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And give him head and give him help <laughs> whenever you can. Give it was him head. Really good. Be a beacon. <laughs> He had another great line that I wanted I wanted to bring up, mm-hmm. and it, it plays into the fact of something I thought very interesting was that the NSA was the good guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, in this day and age, that's adorable. But <laughs> back then, I mean, apparently it was taken for granted. But uh, one yeah, of the I think things... the FBI was the boogeyman. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, was... The, the, the FBI and the was, CIA, oh, you're the, you're the guys, guys Nixon. FB, yeah. FBI, you're the guys I hear breathing on the other side of my yeah. phone. No, that's no, that's the FBI. Oh, you're just the one that topples governments. No, yeah. that's the CIA. Yeah. We're the good guys, Marty. And I thought that was adorable. But the best line I, I thought, and he, it was so understated, no one really reacted to it. But I was like, I just started howling when I heard this. And he said, I could have joined the, NS- the NSA, but it turned out that my parents were married. And yeah, and that was good. That was good. I mean, and just calling them like, a bastard Arr! so yeah. nicely. <laughs> he was about to get bull rushed also. Did you notice the car he drove? Oh, yeah. The Carmen Ghia? <sighs> yeah. yeah. I had- Convertible. I was obsessed with Carmen Gia's in the we 90s. All were they were point. so beautiful. And when uh, I didn't remember that that he drove one in the movie, mm-hmm. but last week, actually two weeks ago, when I was rewatching this movie with my partner, 
he drives up and she's like, what is that? I was like, baby, it's a Carmen Ghia. <laughs> Trust me. Do you mind if I get into the one part? I was talking about it earlier. The There's one part of this movie that I thought was poorly done. It wasn't the acting and it I'm, wasn't the I'm cinematography. I'm curious to know. Yeah. The sound design. Oh, I the sound yeah. design was poor. hit you so hard right now. No, it I'm, was. I'm in the middle here. My nostalgia wants mm. to be in love with this mm-hmm. the sound, but yeah. the music. I thought the music. It was wasn't a the weak. music. It was the car doors opening. It was oh, the, okay. the the footsteps. It was the foley. It was the uh, the the punches. Oh God, gonna, the punches! I Definitely thought you were going with the, the soundtrack. Punches. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, come on now. The man's in a suit jacket. It's not a no, sword thought, slicing through the air. I thought the score. <laughs> I thought the score was pretty good. Agreed. I liked the undercurrent. I liked the the background music. The actual like it was it was the motion music, ones though. It, like. it wasn't whoever did the technology did a good job. All the uh, all the switch flipping, all the the plugins, everything that the had foley. to do with yeah, their the foley was bad. Well, there was two parts of the foley. Uh, there was someone who was working in a studio doing footsteps and making swishes. And then there was someone else who was flipping switches and doing bod modem sounds. It's all the same. I don't think it was because half of it was good and half of it was bad. They could have just been good at one thing and That's terrible possible. at everything else. I, I would just like to say that that I loved every part of this movie except that. Except for the Foley? Yeah. Your Foley artist for sneakers, Matthew hates you. No, I, d- <laughs> I don't hate you, man. I just I think you could have done a little better. I hate you a little. I thought you were going with the sound itself. The score was no, bad. no. That's that's where I thought you were going, and I was about ready to go fisticuffs with you, because this the the music that was done, the score for it was James Horner, who has mm-hmm. unfortunately passed away. What, uh, really? Yeah, he passed away a couple of years yeah, ago. I, know that, I didn't man. even know that. Yeah, he did the score uh, many, many, he did many everything. movies and, and yeah. TV shows, but notably Titanic, Avatar, he, yeah. Braveheart, which is one of my ultimate like go to bed albums that I love to listen to. Uh, and then the Rocketeer, which is another really good one. Of oh yes, I, know, I love the Rocketeer. That's I mean, it's no movie. Sky Captain I would in the wanna... World of Tomorrow, but it's. Not bad. <laughs> I would say we put the Rocketeer in the list, but it's just one dude. Yeah, yeah. It's it, not many games. One dude. W- one one guy that saves his girl. You know, I I, w- I would like to know. say that we don't have to put movies that only have one off of the gaming list mm-hmm. because if it has an interesting world that you want to play in, that would be That's okay. A- good point like yeah. like with the fifth element it was a duo you said yeah, every, every everyone else was an npc it was it was but it that was three. world mm-hmm. you could be i mean you could play the world and yeah. not be the hero so the the interesting thing though with with the score kind of to circle back to that i'm sorry yeah no uh <laughs> that uh the, the director robinson was amazing at if you really listen to the score through the whole movie there's a tonal change when it goes from being a comedic movie to a suspense thriller movie there's the heavy piano that gets changed. Yeah. It's the scene where they realize when Whistler is is testing the box to see what it can do. Yeah. That and, was a beautiful scene. And it was. And and it's high it's it's highlighted by the music in the background, the the heavy piano chords yeah. that's being played where they're realizing exactly what this box can do. So that scene, mm-hmm. that that shot from underneath the table yeah. as they spill out the scrabble tiles. Mm-hmm. That wowed me when I was just watching it recently. I was really in appreciation of what of the way that that scene was set up. There was a couple moments like that. There was some really interesting cinematography done where they bring it into a V a mm-hmm. couple of times. Mm-hmm. That That is incredibly hard to pull off where they go from the top left and the top right. Mm-hmm. But it's centered there and there's action on all on both sides. That is so hard to do when they did it with style and aplomb. But also the reflection of the code in Whistler's in the glasses. glasses. I wanted to talk about yeah. that because that that's a common that was thing. Great. Wonderful. Now it is. Now that's it's a common, common thing. But well, I that's probably it. the first. Well, I always hate it when it's a reflection on someone's face. That yeah. always kind of weirds me out because that rarely happens unless someone you've seen it with TV, it but the, the code dropping on like someone's that? face. Mm-hmm. But in the glasses, it's like that was just beautiful because he has those big old thick. Blind yeah. guy glasses. And whoever did I'm sorry, did you Oh, I was gonna circle back to your to the cinematography, the director of yeah. photography. Uh he worked on Field of Dreams, which is also was uh, another movie that this director had worked on previously, uh-huh. but I really didn't get a chance to say who it was directed by. So I'd like to kind of go in that route real quick, because it was directed and written in part by uh, Phil Alden Robinson. 
I, I feel like I should know that name. Field of Dreams is a very notable movie that he did prior mm-hmm. to this, uh, which a lot of people do love. You're cringing. I can see your kind. Your eye is twitching. Another James Earl Jones movie. And another Kevin right? Costner movie. Well, even James Earl Jones couldn't <laughs> save that shit. <laughs> you, uh, Baseball, uh, Ray. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, nope. 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 Continue, Dusty. <laughs> it was also co-written by Lawrence Lasker and Walter F. Parks. In Lawrence S- Kaz. Wait, sorry. Not, Lasker. not the Star Wars guy. No, yeah, Lasker. Okay. Not Kazden. Lasker. Uh, okay. Who those two were the team for the Matthew Broderick movie War Games, which Fuck I yes. love. Yes. Which, I can way, agree with that because it had good actors doing well in their roles. I must say that Abney Coleman on the subject of gaming, war games and sneakers have a lot in common. Yeah. Yeah, they do. In they, fact, there the are a couple games, things that actually I, I, I want to get into with that. They do have a, a few things that are similar. All of the game ideas that I'm bringing will function just as well for the two. Oh, awesome. One of the things that I liked was that the technology that was used is the technology that was used to tell the story. And it doesn't ever get oversaturated. It really feels more current. I mean, the movie could really kind of, most of it could sit in today's theaters. And I don't think a lot of people would even bat an eye, except for modems and wondering what those are. Yeah, the cradle modem. Yeah. I love that. It's a film more about characters first and then the gadgets second. Oh, agreed. I don't think a, a van full of people spying on other people is ever going to be out of time. No. No, I, I would yep. I would have to agree with that. So Professor Len Alderman is one of the three mathematicians who invented the RSA crypto system. He's actually the A in that RSA. Uh-huh. And what, he's, the, what is the R and the S? I don't I, know. I don't know. I, I should know. I, I don't know. This is my job. <laughs> I don't know. And he's currently like the preeminent, which, which is... That system is currently the preeminent method of encrypting any kind of data in in the world. Alderman served as a mathematical consultant on the film and spent several days constructing this the the slides that Janik uses in, in oh his, yeah 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 in the, his, the mathematical slides yeah all those displays at the college symposium as those unbreakable codes. So Alderman took a considerable amount of time to create those slides using extremely primitive early 90s uh, computer graphics system, which was very slow and was a hindrance. In the end, the writer and director of the movie, the writers and the director, had the slides transposed on oil crayon scribbles on account of the notion that that's what a regular mathematician would have done. And Alderman later remarked that that was indeed true. He would have done it himself. And he complained that that would have saved him nine or ten days (laughs) worth of time if they would have let him do that originally. This movie, if you redid all the set dressing, mm-hmm. works today. Oh, I agree. The no, co- I don't. Costuming I doesn't. Costuming I doesn't. I don't think this movie would succeed at the box office today. Really? It's too intelligent. Oh, I. There's not enough action. There's not enough explosions. Yeah. And the guns are never actually ever. It depends done for on who it's marketed to. It wouldn't succeed at the box office. Now, a movie like this could re- be released, say, straight to Netflix mm-hmm. for yeah. targeted at an older crowd, and it would succeed on yeah. Netflix. Or, no, or, no or I, I, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. Or I, it would I go to the art house movie theaters because yeah. it doesn't have yeah. big it robots would, that explode. It might be released on the Sundance. <laughs> now that would just be Ouroboros of fucking cinema. But right I don't, there. I don't really see something like this and the the slow, relatively slow pace of the story, the thoughtful, the slower paced. Story. And I have to say that's. I'm sorry, Dusty. Okay. I have to say that's half of the charm of this movie mm-hmm. is that it it reflects a lot of the the older values I mean, of, everybody of good in it, cinema except for except for river phoenix was older so mm-hmm. it was well, really I, a I story would... about people 40s and older being criminals yeah i will say this any game system that you want to try and and play this this type of game in it's going to have to be heavy on skill checks because it is it is less yeah. it is less combat and it is heavy on skill it's checks it's a lot of sneak i have opinions on that that i'm going to hold until our next section okay which is coming up next. Hello, everyone. You are listening to Half Movies Will Game, and this is Nathaniel. We're about halfway through the show, with a lot of exciting RPG content coming up in just a minute. First, I want to take a very quick moment to tell you a bit about what we're up to here. We recorded these first four episodes as a proof of commitment to ourselves before we went forward with an official launch. We learned a lot through this process, upgraded our equipment a little bit, figured out some tricks that we didn't really know going into the thing. We hope you can hear our improvement as the show progresses. 
Please bear with us as we iron out the wrinkles and know that we appreciate any feedback you have for us, especially so at this crucial early juncture of the show. In the future, this break space will be used to promote our friends and sponsors, and we're excited to talk more about them. So thanks again for making it this far, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the show. Now that we're back, let's talk about some exciting role-playing game stuff. I want to touch on some feedback that I've gotten, that okay. we've gotten here as a show. We are three guys who enjoy gaming, but we are not completely dialed in to the feed 24-7. No. We, we all enjoy playing games, but I, I think I can speak for the three of us and say that I'm the one who pays the most attention to games. Oh, easily. Yeah. yeah. I'm the one that pays yeah. the most attention probably to the movies, and Matthew pays attention to other things, which we'll talk about at some point in the future. But part of the fun for us here is the big reveal. We actually don't discuss what games that we're going to be bringing to the table here. We we make it a point to kind of keep that secret because both these guys are kind of interested in, in what I'm going to bring in. And sometimes this requires me to do some research and look into games that I've never read before. Sometimes I've heard of them, but I've never played a lot of the games that we. Talk I don't about. think a single human being could play every every system that's oh, out there. Oh, oh, oh! There are people, and they're probably listening, and they might have something to say about the games. Oh, please leave your comments wrong, in the comment section sorry, below. <laughs> but we're we're gonna do our best to do justice to these games. If we mess something up, let us know. Again, we're not experts. We're just doing this for fun. And at the same time, we can't play every single game all the time. Yeah. And I can't watch every single. Movie However, if any made. one of you is independently wealthy and in love with the sound of my voice, or and mine. you want to pay me to play games, I'm good. all the games, I swear to God, I'll do it. I don't even. I don't eat expensively. Just, just hot a pockets. bottle of old granddad. <laughs> a bottle of old granddad in hot pockets. We still have a lot to learn, and I'm hoping that all three of us can learn stuff about games, and I'm hoping that also I can encounter new games that I've never heard of, and then. Through that knowledge, introduce these games mm -hmm. to my two fellow co-hosts here. So one thing that struck me about sneakers is, and I've mentioned this before, it's kind of high tech, but low fi mm -hmm. Yeah. And definitely low violence. Yes. So there's a lot of technology, but the movie doesn't focus on the technology. The technology is a means to an end of a conspiracy story. So it's not like hackers, which is all shiny stuff and right. the Gibson mm -hmm. and it's flying through cyberspace. A lot of the stuff that happens in sneakers is just almost casually mentioned. Yeah. There's a little focus of something happening on a screen, and then the story moves back to the characters and their interactions and what's happening in the story around them. Mm -hmm. So a number of suggestions were come to me. One of the suggestions was D20 Modern. Thanks for bringing that up. I Some Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I played one game in this. Uh, D20 Modern. Okay. That's what I was going to go with, actually, is D20 yeah. Modern. This, this struck me... As not so much, we've, we've gone a, a couple storytelling routes. Yeah. Before. And I honestly think that the, the, each, each character in this had a, a very particular skill set, which defined their character. And I thought D20 Modern would be a good way to bring that out because it's mm -hmm. a very heavy skill system. And as there's, there's very little actual combat, more evasion and things like that, I, I thought that would be, uh, that it, that it would be a good match. Yeah, and there's a lot of subterfuge yeah. as well. There's a lot of hiding. There's mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, pick lock Pers versions. Persuasion. Of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh there's there's a lot of diplomacy checks. There's a lot of it it really works for it, in in my humble opinion. Now that being said, I don't have the book on me. I played it in a friend's game, but from the moment I saw them in the van and that each of them doing their own thing mm -hmm. and watching them make skill check after skill check after skill check after skill check, I thought well, in order to recreate this, you, you have to have a very skill-heavy system, which is what the D20 system is. I, it is overly so, even <laughs> from time to time. But if you wanted to play a, a skilled base instead of a combat, or as in melee, or ranged, or explodey mage, you, you would want to probably go with D20 Modern. But I see your eyes narrowing, so... so there's a lot to be said in favor of D20 Modern. It's a familiar system that a lot of people know. And I know that the dungeons or the D20 system of the third edition, for which that was pretty popular, has kind of fallen by the wayside with the advent of fifth edition and mm -hmm. all yeah. the stuff that's come out of it. And I haven't actually seen a fifth edition modern game. Come I, out. I haven't either. I would like to go on record as saying I am not going to recommend any Palladium game for this. 
<laughs> oh, really? Not okay. Anyway, not ninjas and super spies, Matthew. <laughs> already did that. You already did that. Mm-hmm. Well, let's dig into this. Let's talk about D twenty modern. It's not what I would personally use, but let's make it a thing. Let's, okay. if you want to use D twenty modern in this, there is a gaming philosophy based on D twenty, and I think it's called like E six or E L six, or maybe it's E seven or E L seven. Oh God, the name is the name is escaping me. the The concept is that in a D twenty system, uh, third edition specifically, your characters never really need to advance beyond sixth or seventh. I think it's sixth level, and that's it. Your characters are limited to a six level progression. With this is six new to me. Being that pinnacle mm-hmm. of where the fun is, right? Anything beyond that becomes more complicated, becomes overbearing. And most games generally don't make it past that point. Anyway, there's a lot of discussion about why to do this. And it's something that I've always found interesting. I've never really sat and read through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But when people have linked it to me, I thought it was pretty cool. For something like Sneakers, I could see D20 Modern working with that kind of a a limit. Yeah, These characters are really good, but you don't... This isn't really There's something where you not think infallible. of experience levels. Yeah. You just think, these are people who are good at what they do. Let's not put a number on that. Let's just make them good. Mm-hmm. So D20 Modern, with the standard basic classes, you have the the wise hero, the smart hero, the charismatic hero, and that's about it. I guess Carl would maybe be the agile or dexterous hero. I I suppose, like, like we were talking about earlier, they, they all have a, a very obvious flaw. Yeah. Every character um, is is exposed to have both a flaw and what I'd consider a, 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 a benefit. And that's what first drove me towards D20 is because that was the first thing I picked up on mm-hmm. when looking for a game to play this was something that would allow them to take a negative, which they gamed out well and made made their character, but would give them uh, a benefit in their specific field that they were looking for. You just got my brain going in a different direction that I wasn't yeah. expecting. <laughs> so White Wolf has a game called Hunter the Vigil. Oh, God. Not Hunter the Reckoning. Oh, okay. Hunter Thank the you. Vigil. Okay. <laughs> Hunter the Vigil was with the New World of Darkness, and it's ah. very much a low-key, you are non-powered humans. Oh, awesome. Okay. So it's got a number of things that I could... Oh, my God. That could actually work for sneakers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things in Hunter the Vigil you work with is you have characters who have somehow encountered something strange with the world. Right. Something supernatural. Like a box that breaks everything open? Yeah. Magic box. Let's just reskin that. Instead of they've encountered something supernatural, they've become woke to the way of the digital world. Yeah. They've become aware of espionage. So these characters, and there's even part in uh, in Sneakers when he's with the fake NSA agents who are reading each character's crib mm-hmm. sheet. Yeah, yeah. A rap sheet. That right there. That is how they became connected to the criminal worlds. Yeah. So you could totally reskin Hunter the Vigil, change the supernatural stuff to the criminal, say, this is, when did your character first become connected to the criminal world? And that's your question that you have to answer in character creation. Right. And then... Hunter the Vigil also allows you to make a pack. You make a team, and you can get team bonuses. Well, hey, they're a team. They, they certainly are, do they work better team. together than alone. They yeah. s- exactly. So when they work together as a team, they get bonuses. So we got D20 Modern. We got Hunter the Vigil. Each of these are easily skinned for a sneaker style game. So the first thing that came to mind when I thought about this was Shadowrun. I Shadow can, Run. I can see that. I, I thought about it too. I had a flaw though. I mean, a big one. Oh, I've got a big flaw with Shadow Run too. Shadow Run is the game that I might actually know better than any other game. Really? At least the first four editions. I ran Shadow Run games almost nonstop from 1994 through about 2014. Mm-hmm. So, t- Jesus Christ. <laughs> 20, 20 years of Shadowrun experience to the point that I was once running a tabletop Shadowrun game that morphed into a LARP because I had 16 people that wanted to play and oh I had no ability God. to turn them down. So it's like, well, all right. You don't know how to say no? Well, I was a teenager. This was, and this was, the, you know, hanging out with all my buds. I like hanging out with my buds. And yeah. they were hot ladies. So, hey, we're going to run a LARP now <laughs> with a shitload of dice. 
Oh my god. Shadowrun is a lot of fun. I have more experience running it, and I will probably never ever run Shadowrun again. Aw. My tastes have moved past it. The massive dice pools, ability counting, modifier calculation. Mm -hmm. Shadowrun is a gear porn game. And while, yes, it is about doing a job, and it's about being uh, a team and working together to accomplish a thing, Shadowrun is all about the gear. You play Shadowrun because you want so to build your, a sweet character with mm -hmm. a lot of gear. Well, the flaws are twofold. One, yeah. Shadowrun focuses so heavily on the gear. This isn't a movie about the gear. But second, Shadowrun is ridiculously complex to play out, and it's almost entirely focused on combat. Yeah. There's no combat in this movie. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to play a combat heavy game? Yeah, that w that was my beta my beta flaw with Shadowrun. My my first one was though is that I I, I look at the world first more than I I, I look at the the yeah. game mechanic to see totally. if it fits. And Shadowrun is not the world for this. There are not transhumans. There's mm -hmm. not half orc. There's not yeah. It's 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 not you would you would have to cut out the entire lore. And to me, it's it's the lore and the world building that makes that makes the game great mm -hmm. a system can always be house ruled or whatever down into something playable but with without the world intact there's really no point in picking a system i mostly agree with you i think uh so i believe in a concept called system matters if you it's a little old school by this point uh but it, it was a founding principle of a late website called the forge and system matters is a concept that, you know, if you want to play a certain game, you need to find the system that matches that the best. Right. You can play an espionage game in Dungeons and Dragons with elves and dwarves. You can. You probably can find a better game for it. Yeah. So system matters. But also, I believe that some systems are inherently universal. Shadowrun's core dice mechanic you can separate that from the, the meta. You can take out the races. You can take out the magic. You, what you've got is a simple base dice pool mechanic. And it, it works. I've run it for things that aren't Shadowrun. I would not run it for this game. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much dice rolling. Even though the game is all about teamwork and espionage on the, on the surface level, it would just bog down. We wouldn't be able to accomplish. I this. have to agree. It, it crossed my mind briefly, but yeah, that this that that isn't the way I'd go with this game. And I I, I just said it, but that that has always been what it is to me. I'm I I, I like story, and I, I find that the story is to a degree matched to the mechanic of playing the game, and it just it doesn't fit. Yeah, it doesn't fit. The second game that came to mind is another one that I love dearly because I love the source material dearly. And this is the Leverage role-playing game. That I'm unfamiliar with that. So Leverage is a television show mm -hmm. that was filmed, well, it, not initially, but eventually it was filmed here in Portland, Oregon. And it's a Timothy Hutton show. Uh, which, it's really good. It's really good. It is competence porn. Every episode, they, it's about a team of criminals who help others. Right. They help them get leverage over somebody who has uh, wronged them. It's a fun show, and it's about a team of criminals, one of which is a hacker, and one of the character roles that you can play is the hacker. And in leverage, you take a group of heroes, and you put them together, and each one has a role, like the mastermind, Robert Redford. Right. Uh, the hacker, which would be... Uh, could be both whistler and mother yeah uh i, I love his name the, by the, the names way of the, other <laughs> yeah, roles, so but the, the infiltrator or the grease man or i'm thinking oceans 11 but uh <laughs> you, you, you know you've got a role for each one but it's also got uh -huh. a tough guy role or you know the muscle sneakers doesn't have the muscle there's no muscle in sneakers there's there's, there's really I nobody would i think muscle <laughs> I, I think Sidney Poitier is 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 maybe borderline but, muscle. Yeah, there get, was a disarm and a beatdown. Mm -hmm. But he has that one moment. It's such a minor part of his role. You ever see My Blue Heaven? No. <laughs> Rick Moranis got one chance to play a tough yeah. guy. <laughs> and he did it when he busted through the door and or was, no, when the was, guy that busted yeah, yeah, through yeah. the door. It was yeah. adorable. But something else that Leverage does is it leans too heavily on the concept of the flashback. So if you've watched Leverage, one thing that happens is in every episode, it gets a little bit far into the story and towards the end, everything seems to be falling in place to make the heroes lose. Now, this is this is a role playing game to, as well as a TV show? Yes. Yeah, so that I'm, sounds I'm, like a hard way to tell I'm a story. I'm talking about the show. So in oh, the okay. show, 
The show builds up so that they get to a point where everything is sort of falling into place, and then suddenly the enemy, the the bad guys, got some kind of a gotcha, or right. oh no, I've ambushed you, and everything's over. Well, then there's a quick flashback that shows one or more scenes in montage style of how the team was expecting this the whole time and set some things in aside or actually put a little thing that you never saw them do and suddenly they pull that out of nowhere it's like this deus ex machina like but it's really storytelling no to it's, me. it's really fun because you watch the show to figure out oh how did they foresee this coming and then you actually go back and rewatch the episode and realize they were hinting at this the whole time but you never saw it that's how the leverage flashback works okay and you might be able to make the case that in Sneakers, at the very end, when uh, the almost very end, when he leaves Cosmo with the box, yeah. and he goes away and he finds out that they've swapped the box, you could say that that was done in a flashback. You know, you never saw it happen. The handoff between between him and yeah, what's it, Floyd? 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 I already forgot his name. That- Carl. Carl. <laughs> you could say that it's a flashback, but I don't agree and i think leverage leans too heavily on the flashback and on the tough guy i don't think leverage would necessarily work for a sneakers game although you could probably pull it off if you wanted a bit more action so we're not going to necessarily talk about it also because i know when i want to bring this game back up anyway what what's the big kahuna the cream of the crop the creme de la creme this one surprised me. Mm-hmm. This isn't even a published game, but when I was asking about it on Reddit, somebody linked me to a game that they have in a current playtest state. I looked it over. It works. It is today's world by a fellow named Clint Finley. So I got a playtest version and I've linked it here. And I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to both of you. Right, thank right. you. Today's world. What is today's world? Drug dealers smuggle contraband into prisons with drones. You can pay back alley body monitors to install microchips in your hands with cryptographic currency. Powerful corporations track your every move, while vast government surveillance systems scan your emails. Oh, that sounds right. Militaries wage cyber warfare across the globe. Cult leaders have the ear of world leaders. And a washed-up game show host is now the president of the United States. This isn't some (laughs) dystopian cyberpunk future. It's today's world. It's a rules-light role-playing game about the strangeness of modern life. The playbooks kind of match different roles that somebody would expect in something like this. And I've already kind of dug through this and figured out what I think each of these characters would be. But there's a good number of them in here to match different themes, such as the Gotham TV show, Crank are given as inspirations personally i think this is sneakers or war games the game this was the system that uh rewarded you with extra dice when you did something well no that's wushu oh sorry So in this system you roll 2d6 once you roll the dice and you add the number if you get a 10 or higher then you get everything that you wanted and then some Mm -hmm. cool things happen in your favor oh right okay if you get a seven to nine you get some kind of a success, but you also get some kind of a setback or a consequence. Usually some kind of a negotiation or a wager. Yeah. If you roll a six or less, the GM fucks you. <laughs> this game, I know that you were saying that this was a skill-heavy movie, but Very I think so. that this game would be perfect with this, where, again, the player's like, okay, well, I want to kind of break this open. I'm going to roll my dice. In all of the Apocalypse World games, you have what are called moves. Moves are kind of like codified versions of what you would do in a D&D game. Mm-hmm. Attack, defend, investigate. Most things that you would consider a skill can be quantified as a, what's called a move. The moves in this game, things like act under pressure, do your homework, read between the lines, work your contacts, persuade someone, intimidate someone, mm-hmm. brawl, and shoot. And then finally, each of the playbooks, which represents a different type of character. In the yeah, game, that's what I'm, I'm going. They have now. their own cool stuff. So let's look at the system seers. The first one on the list. <laughs> this is Whistler. You see things others don't. Connections, patterns unfolding fracturally. Some people call it apophenia. Others call it genius. To you, it's just nature. And that's freaking Whistler. Yeah, he that, hears that is, yeah, everything around. Yeah, him. I was flipping through the, the copy that you yeah. gave me and I saw that and I was very much Whistler. 
other characters that might work here the seeker the seeker could be a good one he's looking for something truth redemption revenge whatever it is the search drives him and consumes him cosmo definitely Mm -hmm. the voyeur (laughs) <laughs> the voyeur doesn't have a description yet uh but you pick one programmer computer security expert i do uh, like the move yeah. hack hack a gibson mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he has a move called hack the gibson yeah. the voyeur i think is mother or maybe carl the badass i would say is Sidney portier uh the schemer is hannibal of the a-team mm-hmm. that one is definitely robert redford I think all of these match up very, very easily to these characters, and they all fit together in a well on a team. So how does play go? This game is based in Apocalypse World, and right now the playtest version of the game assumes that the reader has read Apocalypse World. Mm-hmm. Uh, this kind of happens frequently when people playtest new versions of the Apocalypse engine. They kind of fall back to it as they mm-hmm. write out their own retelling of that game. Essentially, the game opens up. Every player picks a character. And you go around and read which character that you are. Right. Then you start to talk about your relationships with each other. And each of these character playbooks has built in relationship connections to the other. For example, the schemer gives you three things. Tell us about a time that a plan went exactly right. Now tell us about one that went completely wrong. So now you get to create some backstory right there on the spot. Tell us about a powerful local person, such as a politician or a business magnate, right there that creates an NPC for the team to use. And then their final one is, which other character in the group do you owe a debt and why? Okay. Yeah. So all the characters come with pre-built ways for the players to add things to the world, Mm -hmm. to add things, to add people for the background for the GM to use, and then to build connections with each other. This is pretty common in Apocalypse World games. Uh, Apocalypse World does it. Monster Hearts was another one. It's about teenage paranormal romance. Dungeon World, which is the Apocalypse version of D&D, does it. They all build these character relations. And you can actually use those relations to gain experience for your character. Okay. Mm. So when the game starts, you pick this. You set all this up. You tell everybody what you're about. You build your relationships. And the GM's furiously taking notes of things to do Mm -hmm. and coming up with, like, bad guys and schemes and stories. And then you just start playing. Okay. And the general concept is, let's play through a day in your life. Where are you? Hmm, What are you doing? And now the GM is just going to follow you around. I like that. It sounds good. And as the GM... I I can see how how when you're watching sneakers and reading through this, you'd think that. Yeah. Yeah, so can I. And as the GM is following you around, he's furiously taking notes of things to use against you. Question. Uh, When stacked between the prep that goes into any D20 game, would you say the feverish note-taking is equal, greater, or less than what the the GM would have to do with this system? The note-taking is minimal. Okay. uh, Because a lot of the game, to run it true, to run a game like this true... It comes more on the player's side. The GM does not come to the table with anything planned on the first session. That's interesting. Hmm. You show up, you build the characters... And everything is based off of something that someone else added or someone said. So you get a group of like three or four people and you're going to build a really rich environment. And then the GM's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to roll with this. Generally, you just find out where they are. Yeah. Start the camera. Yeah. yeah. That's an interesting take on it. It's uh, like, like storytelling dice, but the storyteller doesn't seem to sit behind the screen. The storyteller is actually out and around the table. That's. And the best part is the GM never rolls any dice in this game. Oh, wow. wow. Everything that happens happens because of something the players did or mm-hmm. something that's happening to them. So that five pounds of dice you have sitting in that tote just now. So if the players would come on, <laughs> like in Apocalypse World, is one of the skills is do something under fire. Mm-hmm. One of the moves. The GM never makes an attack. They say, oh, somebody's shooting at you. What do you do? Right. They're like, okay, well, I'm going to try and get away. Okay, well, you're going to do something under fire, so roll your dice. So one thing I I was really enjoying about this is kind of the tongue-in-cheek of it. There's a part that says GM stuff, which I suppose is the the Mm -hmm. DMG for this. And in there is a couple of things, GM agenda, GM principles, GM moves. But what really grabbed my eye and something that I think I would really enjoy about running it, because this is one of my strengths, is GM principle number one, bar fourth dystopia. That's a play on the apocalypse world, which is yeah. bar fourth apocalyptica. Uh, GM moves 
Offer them an opportunity with or without strings attached. Hmm. Reveal information. Present them with a dilemma. Throw them into a high-pressure situation. Have an NPC cash in a favor. Have an NPC go over their heads. Make them spend. Deal harm. Throw them in jail. <laughs> and this is either the perfect sneakers game or the perfect usual suspects game. Yeah. There's GM principles. Embrace contradictions and strange juxtapositions. Place a black metal band at a fancy cocktail party. Give a homeless person a <laughs> PhD in computer science. <laughs> Play country music at a golf club. Put the upscale organic grocery store next to a needle exchange. Oh. Are you sure this isn't set in Portland? So it sounds like Portland. <laughs> Those sound like some parties that I've run before. I, I will say this is a fantastic game to play sneakers in. I, I would agree. I, I would say a lot of this one is going to depend on who's around you, who you know is a gamer. So yeah, I mean, I, I think D20 Modern is, uh, is a very playable system with this. And this one is also very playable. So you, you get a bonus this time. It's not only one, it's two. You have we two could different put ways. Five movies in the rotation, two of which are sneakers. Anyway, big shout out to the author of this game, Quint Finley. I, I hope that you can get some feedback out of this. I hope that people find it interesting. It, I know it's unpublished yet, but it looks really solid. Hey, Clint, if, you. if you're actually listening to this, this is good work, man. You should, yeah, I agree. You should, you should polish this up. This is, this is a, a worthwhile thing you have going here. And I would really like to see your finished product because I, I'd like to play sneakers. I, 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 I can't tell you how disappointed I am that I hadn't seen this movie yet. I now. was very surprised that you had not seen it's, this it's movie. A, I have a couple strange holes. In in my movie watching in my movie lexicon. Oh, that's fine. Like, so do I. I mean, despite all the movies that I've watched, there are some that even people that know my movie history, they, they they're like, "Well, you haven't seen that movie." Like, yeah, like I can't watch every movie all the time. Yeah, I mean, there's I as hu- we make more and more humans, more and more product come out. It's 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 hard to keep up. <laughs> and well, speaking of movies, what's our next one? Come on, guys! It's another one you haven't <laughs> seen, right? Valeria. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fuck. I, w- I was thinking of the game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So bringing yeah. it up to our next movie, uh, we'll be watching Valerian. This I've is actually done this fairly new. Yeah. Uh, that came out last it, week, it, the twenty first of July. It came out. Yeah. We're I, in... I saw it last night. Actually. Yeah. It was good. No I'm, that's all I'm gonna. Uh, that's that's all I'm gonna say. I liked it. There's a there's a there was a lot of negative buzz on it, but. I'm a big fan of the I, original series, so I hope it doesn't disappoint. Your face tells me everything I. <laughs> well, I, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. hey, let me, let me. I'm gonna backpedal on that one a little bit, uh, a lot, because <laughs> I don't know any of the source material. I had no idea. Me either. I'm going into this. That line. This was based off of a a very long running French sci-fi comic series. Mm-hmm. But for as someone that didn't know that, and mm-hmm. someone that just went to see a another Luc Besson movie sci-fi movie who's that i've never heard the name i really <laughs> liked it right on so but you knowing all the material you're probably gonna go they forgot this they forgot that they didn't do this where, oh wait where you was know, this i'm gonna try not to i'm gonna try and go into this movie i like to look at movies as they are like mm-hmm. like lord of the rings i know the lord of the rings was not exactly like the books mm-hmm. but you know what i'm glad it wasn't like the Same books here i think it was a better movie because it agree. strayed from it and everything else that breaks from the books i'm okay with that so if Valerian breaks away from the source material, that's fine. I just hope it's an entertaining story. Yeah, it is. Well, I uh, it. that's that's going to be the break, I think, because next week, the next episode we're going to release will actually be da, 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 our first video episode. Yes. And what are we doing here? I believe we're playing Suicide Squad yes. with a special guest. Mm-hmm. And uh, this will be a live video episode. You can actually see what my poor tragic face looks like <laughs> as well as mine and i'll um, be wearing a bag over my head <laughs> <laughs> just kidding i'm fucking gorgeous he does have a high charisma role that's true so yeah we're going to be bringing that to you next week and this is this will be the uh, wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the the very end of this first uh series, series. series. Yeah. yeah so if you've been listening from the wait, beginning we'd wait, like to thank you so very much just agree on how we were going to call we agreed a while ago, but yeah, yeah. it's the first time we all said it together. Okay, yeah. yeah <laughs> saying, this we is, went from batches to batches, episodes. Batches, seasons, episodes, seasons. yeah, yeah. Series. But this, this is the... Uh, murder. It's a murder of episodes. <laughs> 
No, let's not. <laughs> Maybe if we don't finish this fucking thing soon. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, we've been doing this for six hours. Dear God. That may be fourth wall. It's been a long day. It's <laughs> but, been a long episode. But. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for staying with us through our first series. My name was Matthew. And this is Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you all next week. Later. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're a new name in the enormous sea of podcasts and appreciate any feedback that you can send our way. If you like what you've heard, or even if you didn't, please leave us a review and let us know. Got a movie or a game that you want to hear us talk about? Drop us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com or hit us up on any of the usual social networks. We'd love to hear from you. The opening theme music is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, part of the public domain and found on publicdomain4u.com. Opening narration is provided by Isaac Scher. Half Movies Will Game is distributed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.